morning again. It's good to be with you. As I said earlier in the class, it was just a pleasure for me to be here. And as I said, Beth and I have uh, looked forward to coming and being with you. And we anticipate a good week. We hope uh, that it goes well. I will uh, hopefully do as well as I can, and hopefully that will be of some benefit to you. Pray that it pray that it will. If you haven't yet taken your Bibles, please this morning take them and turn to the book of Second Peter. We're going to be spending most of our time in Second Peter today. Looking at some things from that particular letter. I, I hesitate to mention the C word, uh, COVID. We're, we're all sick and tired to the point that we're sick and tired. I mean that literally and figuratively in whatever ways we can say it. But we're all just tired of thinking about that. But I think it is safe to say that it has, in some ways, it's kind of wreaked havoc on it's just some of our enthusiasm, and, and, and I'm not, I'm, I may be talking to people whose enthusiasm has not been dampened, but just in my conversations with people across the country, it seems to me that there are, there, there are times, and there have been times in the past several years, where we've just kind of gotten down, and uh, in, in essence, a little bit become a little bit stagnant, because we're just a little uncertain as to what direction things are going in, but but I think that always happens. I think for Christians, I think there are just times that we go through. We go through some highs and we go through some lows. And I think that's what Peter is trying to address anyway here as he's about to close his life. And I want to just read for emphasis sake the passage that, that Todd just read for us from 2 Peter 1. I just want to read it again if I may. And I want you to think about what Peter's saying as he probably addresses these brethren for the last time and writes something final for them to consider. Here's part of what he says. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it's right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my Decease. It is clear that Peter will soon pass. It is equally clear that he wants to tell them some things, listen carefully, things that they already know. He's not interested in telling them really anything new. He just says, I want to remind you. And he mentions that not only in the passage I just read, but he's going to talk about that as we'll look at throughout this entire letter. He reminds them of things that they already know. As a matter of fact, the way he says it is, I want to remind you of things that you're already established in. They are things that relate to truth, and you are established in those things. I'm going to suggest that most of what you hear from the pulpit, and this is a compliment to Scott, not something that would be negative. My guess is that most of what you hear from this pulpit are things that you know. You may learn things. I'm confident you learn things from his preaching, the teaching and the preaching of other people. But most of what you hear, if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, or you've been a, a Bible believer for any amount of time, or a Bible studier, you know things. As a matter of fact, you're established in that present truth. And Peter says, what I want to remind you of are things that you already know. But I need to do it because I am going to pass from this life. And these were important things to him. And because they're important to him, it seems to me that they ought to be important to us. You need to be stirred up. Some of you got up this morning, you drank coffee. Did any of you girls drink coffee this morning? No, okay. Well. Most of you probably drink coffee the wrong way. You don't drink it black, which is the way it was intended to be drunk. You get up and you put, you, you, you put something creamy in it. You put something out of a pink packet, a white packet, a blue packet, or a yellow packet, or maybe some other kind of packet. And then you flavor it with who knows what. I don't know who created Bohemian Northwest California, something or another, but it's crazy stuff that you put in it. And when you do all that, you drink it the wrong way. But when you do that, if you do that, once you put it in, what do you do with it? You get some, I, I use my finger, I didn't bring my stir, but you get something and you stir all of that because you're trying to agitate that coffee. Every time you take a sip of that coffee, you want it to taste the same. So you agitate that. You don't let it sit 
And you don't let it become stagnant. You stir that coffee up. How many times as a kid where they're wasping your yard and your mother said, don't stir them up. Don't agitate them. Don't make them angry. Don't make them move. And so we understand exactly what that is. And we need to be stirred up from time to time. You may find this hard to believe. No, you won't. Scott needs to be stirred up. There are times, and you know, he's going to expect you to do that. There are going to be times when he needs his, needs his hands lifted. And that's going to be you to help him. And as somebody who tries to do the work that he's trying to do with you, I understand some of the things that he goes through. Hey, it's not always peaches and cream when we come to church on Sunday morning. I can tell you that right now. We may have had a bad night too. We may have been dealing with certain things too, just like all of you do with your family. All of us, all of us need to be stirred up from time to time. And Peter says, what I want to leave with you as I hope are some things that will stir you up. So later on in the chapter, he says this in 2 Peter chapter 3. He says this, Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. I cannot overemphasize the fact that it's the words that stir up. It's the words, as he says here, it's the words of the holy prophets and the apostles. And that's why when, when, we, when we study and when we speak and when we talk about spiritual things, we begin and we end with the word. And he tells us that we need to remember these words. That's why what we're doing this week is so important in all of our classes and all of our studies. But I want you to think about this idea of remembering. What does it mean? To remember. In 1836, a group of freedom fighters in Texas were defending the Alamo. And General Antonio de Santa Ana, the general of the Mexican army, came in in April of that year, and he and the Mexican army overtook the Alamo. And depending on what history you read and what history you believe, killed all that were in the Alamo on that particular day. It was a great victory for the Mexican army. And six months later, as these freedom fighters reassembled under the leadership of General Sam Houston, they met the Mexican army at a place called San Jacinto. And they overtook the Mexican army, and they defeated that Mexican army. But for the six weeks prior to that, from the time the Alamo was taken, the battle cry that was attributed, at least initially, to General Sam Houston was, when you go into battle on this day, remember the Alamo. That wasn't so that they could pass Texas history. It wasn't that they could remember the date itself. They wanted to be, they wanted to remember the significance of that day. Remember the Alamo. And that was a battle cry. And no doubt that battle cry, as do many other battle cries, helped motivate them to fight to the finality on that day and to gain, at least initially, their independence from Mexico. Last week, on the 13th of June, Beth and I were married, had, well, had, were married 36 years. It's been a great 36 years. That was our anniversary, and we weren't quite able to celebrate it because we were involved in some other things, but in time, that's going to happen. 36 years. And neither one of us, I think, unless we lose our mind, and that could happen. But neither one of us is going to wake up one morning and forget that we're married to each other. I remember the day well. She remembers the day well. And we know what that date means to us. She's not concerned that I'm going to forget that I'm married to her. I don't think. 
But there may be times where she's concerned that I remember the importance of that I remember the significance of Now let me get to something more important that we're going to do shortly. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, He said, do this in remembrance of me. How many of you this morning got up and said to yourself, now what is it that I do on Sunday? What is it that I do on the first day of the week? I, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't, I don't remember what it is today. And what's the significance of that in my life as a Christian? Nobody got up this morning and began to ask those questions. Why? Because we know what it is. We know that the central part of what we're doing in a moment and really for the whole day is remembering the death of Jesus on the cross. And we will do that. We will remember that in, a, in His way in just a moment. But may I tell you, I believe with all of my heart, Jesus is not concerned that we'll forget that He died for us. That's a historical fact that I don't think I'll ever forget. And I don't think you'll ever forget it either. Jesus doesn't want us to take this supper because He's afraid we'll remember what happened. He's afraid we'll remember how important it is to us. It's the significance of the fact that this supper serves best for us. That's why we remember it. He wants us to remember that in that particularly special way. It is the significance of the facts, as I have stated. So what is it that Peter says, I want you to remember? Well, let's go to the third chapter further down. In verse 3, he says this, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, and saying, where's the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment, and perdition of ungodly men. Well, in vacation Bible school, we're talking about water. I figured I'd talk about the flood for a minute. Peter says, I'm about to die. And he says, there are, there are people, he calls them scoffers. He said, they're coming to you and they're saying things and they're asking the question, where is the promise of His coming? You people live like the Lord's going to return. And what He says to them, what are those scoffers are saying? You've lost your mind. Well, why would you be living like you're living? He's not going to return. Matter of fact, He said, or they say to Him about them, He says, but they willfully forget. That's what Peter says about these scoffers. They willfully forget. Have you ever willfully forgotten something? Have you ever just put something entirely out of your mind? And you willfully did that. That's what you did. That's what Peter says they're doing. And he says, they willfully forget what? That by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. In other words, the flood was real. God did destroy the earth at one point in time. Not entirely, but He destroyed all who were on it except eight people. And he says, you need to remember that. Don't believe what the scoffers are telling you. And I would tell you now that there are people who scoff, and listen carefully to this, there are people who scoff at what we're doing right now. You know, there are people who look at us and say, you people have lost your mind. There are people in your neighborhood that see you leave your neighborhood on a regular basis, particularly on a Sunday and a Wednesday. And this week, even more. And they know where you're going, and they're probably looking at you going, what are you doing? What are you doing? You believe, you believe all that fantasy? You believe all that, those mythical things? You believe in God? A lot of people are doing that. They're, they're scoffing at us because of what we're doing. And Peter says, there are people scoffing at you. But Peter says, before I die, I want to remind you of three things that you ought never forget. These are important. That's why I'm sharing with you this morning. We talked about the beginning in our class this morning. Now we're talking about the end. What's going to happen when the Lord does return? When the earth is destroyed? Here's what Peter said to these people. 
In verse 8 he says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Now, I want you to think about what, what, what's said. I want you to think really hard about what's on this, what's on this chart right here. Can you fathom that? Listen. To the Lord, one day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years is like one day to the Lord. You and I can't even fathom a thousand years. Now, we got the one day. We understand the one day, 24-hour period. But do you understand what Peter's saying? Peter is saying God doesn't live in time. And I'll tell you right now, that's hard for us to understand. God lives out of time. God is what? He is eternal. He is odd temporal. Temporal things do not affect God. That's not who He is. It's hard for us to understand that. I just finished teaching a quarter on end times, afterlife. Let me just, this, is, this don't cost anything. Don't ever volunteer to teach a class on that. That's the hardest, I think it's the hardest stuff I've ever taught. Because to every answer, there's four questions. And that's the way that is. It's the afterlife. None of us know about it. It's the end of time. None of us know about it. It's what's going to happen. And, and none of us know about the afterlife. And we're trying, and I, I think it, it's intended for us to know some things. I think God reveals some things. But most of that is we don't know. But one of the concepts that we were trying to get, get, our, get our minds around was God is eternal. And what does that mean? If I ask you that question this morning, what would you say to that? God's eternal. Well, at least part of that is he lives outside of time. It's, it's, it's really hard to define, I think. Just like it is, it's hard to define that God lives out of time. The reason that that's hard for us is because that's exactly where we live. Before, I, before we came up or before Beth and I came, do you know how many questions I had about time? When is the VBS? How long does it last? How long do I speak? When does it start? When is it over? I mean, it, there's hundreds of questions. There'll be other questions this, this week that relate to time. Our lives relate to time. You couldn't function if it weren't for time. I couldn't function in it if it weren't for time. And Peter says, let me tell you something. You people who are saying that God's not going to come back because He hasn't yet come back and because you think He's just forgotten you, here's what you need to understand. God doesn't live in time. Does it ever cross your mind possibly that God's not going to do what He says? Do you ever say to yourself, you know, it has been a long time. It's been several thousand years. It has, it has been a relatively long time. Maybe, just maybe, that, that you start to think like a scoffer. First thing Peter says, the very first thing. As a matter of fact, it's not only the first thing, it's the one thing that he says, don't forget. Look at that. Do not forget this one thing. You may forget the rest of it, but don't forget this. God doesn't live in time like we do. So just get that out of your head. He's our temple. And then he says in verse 9 this. He says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is one of my favorite verses in Scripture. Peter says, it's, The Lord's not slack. I know what they're telling you, but the Lord's not slack. He's not forgotten. He's not slack concerning His promise, like they say He is, but check this out. He is long suffering. I want you to trend, uh, transcend yourself to God real quick. I'm going to give you 10 seconds to be God. I want, I'm going to give you 10 seconds to not only be God, but to be everything God is. If you looked on this earth, and you saw what he saw, would you put an end to it? 
Would you shut it down? Would you burn it up? Can you imagine what God sees when He looks down here? I have a dear friend who has preached for many years early in his preaching life. He was at the building one day and he decided he was going to come home for lunch, which was not his normal routine. He came home from lunch and he pulled into his driveway and noticed a truck that he didn't recognize in his yard, in his driveway. So he just walked in the house and didn't see anybody, walked into the bedroom, and his wife was in bed with another man. He turned around, not knowing exactly what to do, stunned. He turned around, walked back outside, got in his truck, and left. Two hours later, he came back to his house. The truck was gone that he had not recognized. His wife was still there. He walked in. And he said basically what I'm about to say to you, to her. He said, I'm not exactly sure what's happened. But I've been thinking about this now for the past two hours. And he said, I need to tell you something. He said, I love you. I've always loved you. I always will love you. And we, we need... Whatever our problems are, we've got to work this out. Which was, I thought, a remarkable thing to say two hours after he'd seen what he saw. She looked at him after he said to her what he said. She looked at him and said, I need to tell you something. She said, I don't love you. She said, I've never loved you. And she said, I never will love you. He thought for a moment and at some point in that conversation said to her, we need to make this work. It, it, it became very sterile in terms of just the conversation. But he said, we need to make this work because it's what God wants. We've got to somehow pull this together and make this work. She consented to stay in the house she consented to make an effort for 18 months they lived in the same house they shared no room together no dining area no living area no sleeping area they shared no room together but they did stay under the same roof for 18 months during that time, she would leave for days at a time and go where he knew she was going. And she knew that he knew where she was going. And yet, he waited. And she would come back to the house eventually. And she would live under the same roof, under the same conditions as she had done for several months. After 18 months, he decided that he would save some money as he could and he bought her a gift. He bought her a ring. He invited her out to dinner. She, she accepted the invitation. They went out. They sat, changing no conversation. Just eating the dinner. After the dinner's over, he reached in his pocket. He pulled out a small box. He put it on the table. He pushed it across. And as he was pushing it across to her, he said, I need you to know this. I love you, and I've always loved you, and I always will love you. We need to make this work. She picked up the box. She opened the box. She looked at the ring. She closed the box. She put it on the table. She pushed it back to the other side. And she said this. You don't know this. I don't love you. I've never loved you. And I never will love you. He said tomorrow. I will be gone. 18 months. Can you imagine? Living under those conditions for 18 months with a woman in the house whom you love, but who does not love you? 18 months 
long suffering. Can you imagine what God sees when He looks on, on this earth? Can you see, can you imagine the spiritual infidelity that God sees and that God can put an end to with one simple command? And yet He doesn't. And here's why I like this verse. Do you know why God, God doesn't do that yet? He's not willing that any. He does not want one person to go to hell. You ever thought about why that is? Because God created hell for the devil and his angels. He doesn't want any of his creation to go to hell. He wants us to be saved. And he's long suffering. And he's doing all he can to see to it that we, we are what we ought to be. My last semester of college, I took a biology course. 21 people in the class. 19 girls and me and Steve Mars. 19 girls who were all nursing majors. Steve Mars and me who were uh, education majors. And Dr. Sears, the first day of class, he knew me and he knew Steve and he knew we weren't nursing majors and he knew they were nursing majors. And after, before class was over, he said, Kenny, when class is over, I want you and Steve to come see me. He said, yes, sir. First class over, we went up to his desk and he said, now, I know you boys don't particularly want to be in this class. And I said, well, it's not the class we mind. There's 19 girls and two boys. We like those odds. But I said, this, this is going to be hard. He said, this is going to be hard. He said, I'm teaching this class for these nursing majors. I'm not teaching it for you and Steve. And I know you're in here because you need the class. I said, yes, sir. That's exactly right. He said, I'm not teaching the class for you. But I'm going to help you. I'm going to tutor you and Steve. Y'all going to be the most educated education majors in biology that's ever come through this university. He helped us. Anytime we needed help. He didn't give us things, but He helped us. He helped us learn. You know why He did that? Because He wanted us to do well. That's the, that's the most earned B I ever got in a class in my entire academic life. He wanted to help us. Let me tell you something, my friends, and I want you to listen to this, please. God wants to save you. He's not trying to send you to hell. He's not trying to make your life miserable because He doesn't want you to be with Him forever. Just the opposite. He wants you to not perish. He wants you to be saved. He is long-suffering. And Peter says, don't you forget that. And I would say this morning to you and to me, we best not forget that. He wants us to be saved. He's pulling for us. He's not pushing us away. That's a whole other series. Scott can work that up. But that's good stuff. God wants us to be saved. I love that. I love that. And then finally this morning in verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come. And it will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. God wants us to be saved. But at some point, whether you believe it or not, whether you think it's going to happen or not, it's going to happen. And time is inconsequential because God doesn't live in time and He wants all men to be saved. But at some point in time, He's going to say, that's it. That's all. And that day the Lord's going to come. And it's going to come without notice. I think about that sometimes. I think about what the day of the Lord is going to be like. And the only question, it's not the only question, but one of the primary questions I have is, am I going to be ready for it? That, that sounds like such a, you know, we, we talk about it, we preach about it, we think about that, but, but it, really is, it really is the question of the hour. It's a question of every hour. Are you ready? At this point, for what's going to happen when the Lord returns? So Peter says three things. God doesn't live in time. 
God's long-suffering. He wants you to be safe. And He's faithful. He always does what He said. You can count on Him. Hey, how about let's say it this way. You can put your anchor in Him. That'll work for the next few days, won't it? He's going to do what He says He's going to do. And our responsibility then is to live like we ought to live. Verse 11, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. I want it to come. Come on. Because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's what I'm looking for. And that's the responsibility, as we talked about in our class this morning. The responsibility that we have is to live a life of holiness and to live a life of godliness. Peter says, of all the things I could say to you, this is what I want to leave with you. Don't you think that makes it important? Of all the things Peter could have chosen to talk about, he says, I want to remind you of things that you already know so you don't forget them. May God help us to remember these things as well. If you're in this audience this morning, and as we've talked about this, you could say to yourself, I am not in the right relationship with God. Let me tell you a couple of things. You may have plenty of time to turn that thing around. You may live many more years without any consequences at all. That may very well happen. I don't know. Because I don't know when the day of the Lord will come. But here's what I know. It was going to come. And when it comes, you're not going to have any more time. So the responsibility that you have right now, if you're going to use the best possible judgment you can for your eternal salvation, you need to correct your life right now if that's what you need to do. Right now. Don't wait till this afternoon. Don't wait till tomorrow. You need to correct it right now. So we, we want to encourage you. As you stand there, as you sing this song with us, we want to encourage you to think about yourself and ask yourself, am I in this right relationship? If you're not, I beg you, I beg you to do something about that. One of, one of the great things that I love about our Lord is He doesn't force us to do anything. He doesn't force us. If you want to live without Him, you want to live apart from Him, you can do that. He said, that's, that's your choice. That's your call. But He said, I've, I've sent my Son because I know that you labor and you're heavy laden and you need rest and you need the solution to your life's problems, and you need an eternal solution, and I've given that to you. So I'm, I'm begging to do something about that. We would implore you this morning to do something about it. If you're in this audience, and you need to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ, come as we stand in Israel.